welcome to the podcast. We have Ryan with us today, who brings more than 20 years of experience in the human space flight sector across various industries like government, academia, defense, and all these other industries related to human space flight. So let's just dive in and understand a bit more about the sector and specifically spacesuits. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to chatting about my favorite so, topic, spacesuits. <laughs> Yeah, so the first question, I guess everyone, again, assuming there's going to be a lot of people from outside the space industry um, listening to this, why do we need a spacesuit? Yeah, so spacesuit is, you could say, your your first line or your last line of defense, depending on how you look at it. Um, it's really that critical piece of hardware that's going to keep you alive, not just in emergency situations, but um, you could say your everyday work environment while well, in the uh, out in the cosmos. There's a lot of uh, different aspects and layers that go into a suit depending on where it's being used, which is you know a big part of how you distinguish what kind of spacesuit you actually need. Um, so we can kind of jump into that, I think, and then uh, based off of that, we can kind of go backwards and forwards, if you will, with the question of why do you need it. Um, but overall, the the human body, you know, we've got consumables that we need. We need oxygen. We need to remove carbon dioxide. We especially need to remove carbon dioxide from near our, our, our like where we're breathing. So it needs to be flushed away. Um, we have trace contaminants that we need to be removing as well. Um, on a fundamental level, of course, we need energy. We need food and water. But a lot of the times when um, astronauts are wearing their suits, they're, you know, it's a shorter duration. So it's not really, it's not really a, a long duration thing where you have to have meal planning involved. Um, but there are solutions for that as well. Um, anyone who has a, a liquid lunch knows about that. So that's mm -hmm. common for people even today and in, um, uh, in their lifestyle. So uh, just on a fundamental level for the type of suits, really looking at EVA and IVA. So EVA's extra vehicular activity suits, meaning anything outside of your spaceship. Um, so you can think of that as the astronauts working on the International Space Station on the outside or the Apollo moonwalkers and, and you know, our future Mars walkers, too. Um, and then IVA is, intra, in, I can't even speak today, intravehicular activity suit, meaning inside the spacecraft. So you're not in the same type of environment as the uh, being exposed to the vacuum of space. Um, and other hazards as well. So th those are kind of the, the fundamental mm -hmm. splits between them. And, you know, for someone who looks at the space, it's, there's a few with different colors that pop up on Google. Uh, I believe there was an orange version back in the day. Some of them look, uh, for instance, the so SpaceX is building are very futuristic and some look very big. So are those the same categories that you're, you're referring to? Or what's the, um, the, the real changes that one has to like take into consideration when you build these different kinds of suits. Yeah. So uh, you said, uh, let's go with size first, because you said big, and that kind of um, is a good way of thinking about some of the differences, because the ones that go on the EVA on the outside, they have to have a lot more layers. They have to have micrometeorite protection, because you are exposed, like even on the surface on the moon, you're exposed to micrometeorites. The same amount that would be hitting the Earth's atmosphere and those shooting stars that you see are things that are extremely hazardous. So it has to have layers that can handle that essentially bulletproof. Um, and you've got layers that have to deal with radiation uh, while you're out compared to the ones that you'd wear inside. And so, and the thermal protection. So you need also cooling layers underneath them as well. So there's a lot, the, the layering actually builds up a lot more when you actually want to be exposed, uh, if you will, to the, uh, the, either the vacuum of space or on the surface of a planet. And so just adding to that, uh, part of my background is actually in lunar dust abrasion and how the lunar dust rips apart materials. And that's because there's no weathering on the moon. So things hit the moon, it pulverizes the rocks and it's actually the lunar dust is as sharp as glass. And so it can rip apart any kind of fabrics, materials, even metals. And so the suit has to factor in that it's in that kind of environment it's going to be dusty. You're going to be kicking it up everywhere. It's going to electrostatically stick to things. And so uh, you need protective layers that can handle that or coatings. Um, and so that that's why you end up with more layers on these. And these suits are a bit bigger on the uh, the EVA side of the things. 
Um, oh. We can talk about colors too. That's yeah. the next kind of area. Um, colors have uh, varied historically. Um, in the shuttle area, they split. They they switched over to orange suits. It's kind of like the safety orange. It was mm -hmm. because their uh, recovery ops, if something went wrong, would be to fish people out of the ocean. And so mm -hmm. the same reason you would have uh, life preservers that are bright colors or orange that are not blue and green um, to, is to have some contrast so you can actually see where the people are. And so that was the same thought process that went into those bright colors. They were very much in tune with where they were potentially landing if something went wrong. Um, nowadays, we have vehicles that also land on land. Um, and so the the color, even though the shuttle lands on land, it, it, the coloration is really just dependent on if you want to have that extra safety factor or not. Uh, you don't want to, uh, you know, it, it'd be nice to have the Boeing blue suit, if you will, by yeah. David Clark. Um, but then in that one's landing on land. So that's a good reason why they were able to go with Boeing blue for that color. Um, but yeah, again, it depends on the profile of where the vehicle's going. Um, in SpaceX's suits, they're basically black and white. So they're, they are high contrast. Um, so they're a little bit easier to see, but it's also, they wanted to have their own design, like this, like totally different than anything before them. And um, they have a lot of different technology features that other suits have not had in the past as well. It makes sense. And it seems like from the description that you're giving me, it's a lot of hostile environments that these suits would have to be operational in maybe unique materials. Is that the reason why they're so expensive? Because you you see a lot of numbers floating around on the web, but to the layman, why are these things so expensive? Yeah, that's definitely a big part of it is um, we're talking about uh, really advanced materials, um, but we're also talking about how the, the way they're put together, it has to be extremely precise. Um, you have to ensure that these things are sealed properly. Um, you can't just, you know, have like your, your shoulder easily stitched. It's got to be stitched with like an appropriate uh, seal and material. And um, so there's different techniques for how you would put different patterns together. Um, each suit um, right now essentially is a custom fit, uh, especially the IVA, the, the ones that are worn inside the spacesuit, uh, inside the spacecraft. Uh, those are custom. So each one has to be tailor fit. Um, the reason why you'd want to tailor fit is that you want to be able to have as much range of motion and mobility as possible. And we can talk about that as well as one of the major spacesuit trades is um, suit fit and pressure and everything. Um, and so you have to have all these specialized machines that are able to um, to work together. And a lot of the Apollo suits and even some of the common suits today are done by hand. Um, so it's a very expensive process. It has to be rated for vacuum. Um, so even inside the spacecraft, um, the whole point of a spacesuit would be if you lost pressure inside your spacecraft. Yeah. Yeah. And so as the pressure is dropping, just say there's a small puncture or hole or in the vehicle, um, the suit needs to be able to withstand the change in pressure, but also the differential pressure between inside the suit and outside and hold that pressure to keep people in a physiological safe environment. Um, if you go too low too quickly, um, some people, scuba divers will be familiar with the bends. Um, so that's as you're coming up too quickly, um, you know, the nitrogen leaves your, your bloodstream and uh, can cause a very painful um, decompression sickness as well. So um, all of that has to be factored into how well these suits can hold pressure and is that the reason why they take so long to build them or are there other factors at play because it seems like it's a very um, manual hand-driven traditional process and when you look at other technologies they would have scaled over a period of time so right. is there any other reason why they take very long even today uh, to produce the suit yeah so the uh, the production rate matches you can say the demand so the number of suits they need that's the that's the rate so um let's we can use spacex as a, an example because they're i guess you could say new on the block in terms of producing spacesuits uh per mission and so their manifest if it increases in terms of number of people that are flying if they if they end up getting like their larger vehicle online and they need a lot more spacesuits then they're gonna have to increase their production and that means that you know with with um 
technology and innovation comes innovation and manufacturing. Um, so that would likely lead to different methods of how you can safely manufacture a suit. And is that partly why we haven't seen very many suits being produced over the years? Because there was no demand. And now with SpaceX and the market, there's going to be a conversation perhaps for the IVA kind of suits. Do you see that going in that direction? Yeah, I think you will see IVA and EVA um, in terms of uh, the demand for them. Um, there are multiple companies that are working on orbital vehicles um, for a lot of different reasons, for research labs, for tourism. And as those numbers increase, that means that there'll be more users, more people available. Um, likely people will want to have their own custom suit. Like it's kind of like, you know, I did this, this awesome, cool thing and I want to have my souvenir spacesuit to show, yeah. put on display. Um, so that's likely the EVA suits are um, a much larger factor of, of on the price tag. So likely you won't see custom um, EVA suits unless you have an extremely wealthy, uh, just say investor or space participant. Um, but those, the, you, you can't really compare the, the dollar to dollar between the IVA and the EVA ones. I think for the EVA ones, you know, most every single uh, spacewalker has their own like name patch and like their logos they put on the outside. Like those, you know, are your souvenirs and maybe what equipment you bring with you is really your personalized camera or something like that. And that becomes the, the memento versus the entire suit. Speaking of which, I think I can see a patch on your shirt as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, always, so, have a, always have a space patch on when you're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. And it appears to me like it's a very specialized skill going into the human factors aspect of it. So what kinds of skills would you need to put a space suit together? Yeah, so there, there's, there's a lot of different things. So um, the manufacturing within itself is a very specialized area. So that that's like an entire part of the industry and the other part that the manufacturer needs to figure out is the user in terms of uh this is where we can go back to talking about mobility is that um there are really three high, hierarchy or like the hierarchy of what a spacesuit needs to do to function so number one like absolutely spacesuit needs to keep you alive so if it inflated and it, you were in a hamster ball and it provided some oxygen and they got you back to earth that's all it needs to do, right? So that's number one. Number two is then to be able to be able to function. So uh, in order to be able to function in your spacesuit, you need to have arms, obviously, and hands like good fit gloves. And you need to be able to reach things that are within your work envelope that are critical, especially um, as you change from going from just wearing your suit to pressurizing it, you lose a lot of that range of motion. And so what that means is that you need to factor that into the design and how you do all the different folds and the material. Um, you need to be able to make sure that that person can do the functional things they need to do to get back down. Um, as a kind of an aside, um, the way to think about a spacesuit is if you didn't have uh, these special folds and bearings and things within yeah. the suit. It's like inflating a balloon and then trying to yeah. bend it. Like your arm is inside that balloon and you're trying to bend it. So without the right patterning, you can't bend easily and you spend all your energy fighting the spacesuit versus doing the work, which is yeah. the second part here. And then the third part of that is like being comfortable and uh, you know, you, you want to wear a spacesuit and it, you want it to, feel like you're not wearing a spacesuit, like you're just throwing on your your winter coat or whatever in a few extra layers and that it's not bothering you or taking away your ability um, to be comfortable. So that's the, the comfort level comes later. So um, that factors into the design as well. That's perfect. And, and, you know, when you look at the evolution, I think we've solved the spacesuit challenge in the 1960s already. And generally, when you look at tech, it evolves over a period of time. So why did it take for the spacesuits this long to look like the way they do perhaps on a SpaceX uh, you know, capsule right now? Because those things are very different from the ones that we've seen in the past. So what is at play in, in that space exactly? Yeah, um, that has to do with just some of it has to do with, um, at least for the EVA suits, with the historical contracting. Um, so just, you know, go backwards, you've got, 
you know, Mercury, Gemini, everything's happening extremely rapidly. They're just trying to figure out a basic suit. And then they hit the point where they're like, we need to figure out EVA during Gemini. And so they're like, how do we add the layers in? Um, and how do we evolve the suit? And that was working fine. And you're in zero G. In zero G, you don't even need legs. You just need to be able to hook your feet into something. You could be in a sleeping bag spacesuit leg <laughs> thing right and then as long as you can hook your feet in and, and move around because otherwise your legs are just kind of there for the ride um and it's all upper body for zero g so that's when you're floating around like around the space station but then when you get to moonwalking you need your legs so they had to come up with a way of doing like a waist bearing and a lot of other um convolutes in the knees so you could bend properly um so with all of that that evolved into the apollo a7l suits um and so that evolution was like the rapid development of an eva suit and then what you're talking about is kind of like from that apollo moonwalking suit you know what happened or didn't happen next was well they knew it worked well and they knew they had a lot of problems with the lunar dust as i as i talked about and they were falling all over the place they had a like if you google Apollo astronauts falling on the moon, I guarantee you won't be disappointed. Um, and you can even show a clip if you want here, but um, they, they Is that had the one of, where they're doing a rebound. Um, they're, they're doing everything. Them. They're, they're twist. They're trying to twist around the field equipment and wiping out. Uh, they're tripping. Um, there's a, there's a lot of things that happened or different types of mobility. They found that if they did like a bunny lopping motion versus um, trying to walk, it helped them, especially kind of bouncing downhill. Um, so the suits were good enough and they were good. They were excellent. I mean, we went to the moon, come on. We had 12 people that, and, and they survived and they they were able to get samples. So it was like good enough. And, uh, but we've, we can do a lot better too. Now that we know about the environment, we know about the dust, we know about how important it is to have mobility in a low gravity environment. Uh, Mars will actually be easier because it's one third gravity versus the moon being one sixth gravity of earth. So there's a little bit more of a vector to help you like be balanced and that should help with mobility of walking as well. And so going from the Apollo suit, the next program was Skylab. So we're going back to zero G um, after being on the moon. And so they really didn't have to modify the suit too much. They had to make it, um, you know, functional and upgraded as they went along. And then from that, they went to the EVA suit for shuttle and then to the International Space Station. So there was, there are changes that were made along the way there, but the, the EMU, which is the acronym for it, um, uh, was essentially just small changes because there wasn't a necessary full redesign needed. So the, the suit problem, there's a couple different suit problems that have come up in, I guess you can say um, the media, um, there was supposed to be an all female spacewalk and they're like, the suits don't fit. And they're like, why don't the suits fit? Like, didn't they, don't they know what they have? And they're like, well, there's not a lot of suits available and therefore there's not a lot of sizes available. And these suits are based off of a long history going back to Apollo. And so the, the way they were designed and made were was only for a certain, I guess, range of size. And so, and the, the limited amount that it, are you know even available on space station and with um pieces being refurbished from the ground like they have to fly pieces back and forth to space station to refurbish them um that led to part of the problem of um delaying that uh which eventually happened so it's not like it didn't happen but it is that there's definitely issues along the way and i think the the supply there is really the big issue right like if you had uh, abundant enough supply and sizes and everything else then th that wouldn't have happened yeah, that um, makes sense. And so for the IVA suits, uh, so again, inside the vehicle, those have changed over time. Um, for the, um, the what they call the pumpkin suit, the orange suit for space shuttle, uh, actually derived from the SR-71 uh, um, pressure suit, high altitude pressure suit, not a lot of differences between the two. And, you know, it was in a similar high speed environment, um, need to have protection, especially after we learned about, um, you know, our earlier accidents with um, Challenger, um, that uh, having a proper fire protected suit and helmet, how critical those were, because they only wore a jumpsuit in like a motorcycle type helmet in that during that shuttle accident. Um, there's a lot of what ifs, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, but they did switch to the other suit after that for safety. Um, and 
you know, that's where it's where we were for 30 years because shuttle was 30 years of a program. Yeah. And then when Constellation came online and all our different plans, um, the realization is that there was really a suit per vehicle. And so there became opportunities to design new suits. Um, so we have Boeing CST 100 Starliner. We have SpaceX and the Dragon um, and uh, Sierra Nevada, now Sierra Space Dream Chaser. Uh, so there's all these different opportunities for vehicles. Uh, and then of course, Orion. Um, so that's another suit. So that's the uh, Ox, um, which is like the advanced suit, basically, that's been upgraded from the previous pumpkin suit. And, and you know, there's been a lot of similar uh, companies involved with the production of suits and life support for a very long time. There's new players involved. Um, so kind of fast forwarding to the demand and how this is... Uh, unfolding is that we now have the X EVAS, another acronym. I know there's gonna be lots of acronyms. Uh, another I love uh, those acronyms. Yeah, a major contract because this is the type of contract that only happens every 10 years. Um, so they've contracted Axiom to lead a team to do the moonwalking suit and they've contracted Collins to lead a team to do the ISS upgraded zero G suit. Um, is that it the Artemis mission that you're referring to? Or? Yeah, so yeah. this is all through the Artemis program. Um, and so X, when you hear X anything in um, NASA speak, it just means exploration in front of mm -hmm. whatever the acronym is. So the exploration extravehicular activity suits or systems. Yeah. Um, and so those new contracts are for 10 years, uh, a lot of money and are going to be developing these EVA suits. Um, likelihood is that the IVA side of things are still going to be developed per vehicle, um, per yeah. customer, um, and be a kind of a hybrid of these things because there's a big difference between IVA and EVA that we, we didn't really touch upon earlier was that an IVA suit, you're inside the spacecraft and you're likely plugged into like the, the air supply. Um, you've got air flow, like fresh air basically being provided for you, depends on the, the cabin mixture. In an, an emergency, you'd have to go to like all, you know, 100% oxygen, because as you lower the pressure, you need to actually increase the, the oxygen percentage for your, to be able to dissolve into your blood for the partial pressure. Um, and so all of that factors into how you would create that suit. So you need like ports on it where the EVA suit is likely to have a portable or primary life support system, which is like the backpack. So if you see the, yeah. the Apollo moonwalkers or the ISS spacewalkers, you'll see the big pack on the back and that's what's providing them oxygen, scrubbing mm -hmm. CO2, um, helping them with cooling, like per, putting a, there's a cooling loop layer that they wear the, the liquid cooling ventilation garment, which is like pajamas with tubes everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, so all, all those factor into, um, um, if you think about in terms of parts, then you think about it in terms of the people that might be involved in building it. Yeah, that makes sense. And if you were to take an analogy um, for space travel, assuming you get the, uh, the fare uh, right, and it's a train journey, you still can't make the journey without having this special costume, right? So if you look at space travel now, they're trying to drop the costs on the per seat. Uh, in, in the vehicles, but it brings us back to the question around, are people ready to make that journey? Because it appears to me from the descriptions you're giving me that there's a bit of a training regime that you would have to go through to operate inside those suits. So do you see that being customized for large scale adoption in the near future? Yeah, I think we're starting to see that already. Um, there's groups that are interested in opening up their own training facilities to do not just um, uh, call it there's there's a few different terms some people say space tours some people say space flight participants um i like to just say explorers i mean it's just simple and that's what you're doing and it doesn't get into like the nuances of like oh it, you're paying money blah 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 i'm like yeah that's a big part of it is that these people have the means to do it but they're also being the kind of the, the initial wave of people that will hopefully lower the cost so that everyone else has these opportunities um, I mean, let's, we can all hope for that right now, at least. <laughs> yeah. um, so with them, there's these, these new programs that are training, not just these participants, but um, they're also trying to help be part of the portfolio of NASA of training the astronauts and not just NASA. I mean, I say NASA a lot because that's the world that I mostly live in. Um, but we're talking about space agencies, 
private industry all over the world um, that have interest in these activities. And there's also people who know that um, uh, physically they might not be able to handle the journey. Maybe, you know, there's a lot of different reasons medically or just could be an age related uh, reason or they just maybe they just oh, I know I get motion sick. It's not really for me, but I still want to experience it. They still might do these training programs so they can kind of experience some of it and have a feel for what it would be like to be um, in that kind of professional astronaut role of, you know, what is it, what kind of training do they do? And so if you think about like a professional astronaut, they spend like a government agency astronaut, they spend years preparing for space flight. Um, you know, you could say three to five years minimum. I think the basic training certification to become an astronaut is still like two or three years, let alone preparing for your custom mission. Um, a lot of the people that are just, that are coming uh, into training now, if you will, for missions, it's, it's totally brand new, a brand new painting, a brand new canvas. Um, people that will train a week to do a suborbital flight. And that's just um, basically a, a up and down reaching the uh, the edge of space uh, and having that amazing experience and then coming back. So that, you know, you need a week, you need to know that you can handle some high Gs. You need to know what it feels like to be weightless, like going like on a vomit comet ride, like with zero G. So you like um, understand how your body is going to feel. So you spend that critical amount of time focused on enjoying yourself versus like, oh my God, I've never felt this before. I'm going to fall into the wall or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. And then the bigger programs, the best example of um, a private program is, you know, what we saw with Inspiration4. Um, and they, they train for months, but that's because that's what they decided they needed. And I think that if you go talk to any of those four individuals, they'll tell you that absolutely every, every minute spent in a simulator or even doing team building activities was critical for even... Um, I don't want to call them that I don't want to say they were just passengers. They were extremely busy with, uh, yeah. with everything they were doing, but like just to have that, you know, multi-day experience, they had to train for months to do that. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Which brings me to the question, what's with that giant big pool that people get into? <laughs> what, what are they trying to simulate there? Yeah. So here's the thing with space flight. Um, the, in order to practice for space flight, you have to, you know, do as best as you can to match the variables of space flight. So if you're playing in a hockey game, you can go play hockey and have a practice on the ice. You're wearing the equipment, you have the same puck. Um, but if you want to go to space, it's kind of hard to simulate all these different pieces. So the best way of simulating uh, a spacewalk, like an EVA, um, let's just say with space station, um, is to make yourself as neutrally buoyant as possible. So you're essentially floating. You and the, the astronauts kind of say that yeah, you're floating, you're, you know, you're in your spacesuit and you're kind of floating in the volume of water, but you still are, you're kind of, you're still feeling the weight of gravity, like within the suit. So it's not exactly the same, um, but it's a way that they can practice, um, like how they would install, I don't know, just say a broken solar panel or a fuel cell. Um, so it gives them, gives them an opportunity to be in a close environment. And so being underwater, is the closest you can be to being in uh, zero gravity space. And you can also wait out like you're on the moon or Mars. Um, so you could add weights and you can actually walk on the bo bottom of the pool or um, or whatever other location. I actually did that with um, my students. I took them on study abroad and um, we were doing basically an introduction to human spaceflight and spacesuits. And as part of that experience, we knew that we'd be able to scuba dive. And for some of them, they were first time scuba divers. Some of them, like as we learned more about this trip, because we did it three times, kind of recommended, hey, you really should get scuba dive certification because you'll really understand what it means to, you know, the whole breathing and pressure changes and why it's important, like how that, and, th and that directly relates to spacesuit design is these pressure changes. Um, and so I was able to like take them for a simulated moonwalk by putting like weights um, on like extra weights on their belt and like a couple extra weights up high. And it was just to mimic what it would be like. And so we did it. Uh, I think we did it two different ways. We did it so that they weren't, they didn't have the extra weight and they just tried to walk on the bottom, like basically neutrally buoyant. And then we added the weight, like what it would be like to have an Apollo backpack on. And 
we took videos and you can see the changes in how they were walking. Like when they're walking without the weight, they're kind of like pitched all the way forward and like trying to make their way along. And then with the backpack, they're still hunched over just like an Apollo, but they're able to actually move a lot smoother. Um, so even that, even just like a one scuba diving experience for a student is enough to like really connect with the space industry and really understand what it's like to experience that. And, you know, it opens up, it does a few things like, yeah, you get to have the experience, but it actually opens up your understanding of um, how how training and analog, you know, simulated missions can play into you doing doing your everyday job, especially if you want a job in the space industry, because you're like, oh, I kind of understand that. I remember when I was in a, you know, two week simulation and we had this problem with um with the internet and we weren't able to do any of the data and it totally derailed the entire day and i mean covid has been a simulation for everyone to understand what it's like to be confined and isolated to some extent and um so these these analogs are just you know that's a whole another topic but that's also yeah. a place where you can test spacesuits and see how they work in uh, a work like underwater is the one that we've been talking about mostly um, but you can take them to um, like I was involved with a four month simulation in the Arctic at a place called F Mars on Devon Island and in the field you're doing real geology real biology um, experimentation with the with the added layer if you will literal layer of wearing a simulated spacesuit and so you try to find out what are the protocols for taking a sample when you have all these extra things uh that are making it difficult for you to move and to have dexterity in your hands and everything else so that i kind of went sense. all over the place with that but like yeah, yeah. so pools yeah. are cool and if anyone's interested in being an astronaut or not even being an astronaut if you just want to feel what it's like scuba diving is like it's awesome Closest. but highly recommend it anyway yeah, that makes sense. And uh, could you maybe explain the analog missions um, and do they connect to the training programs for astronauts in any way or are they a separate track altogether that people engage in, as you mentioned, for research and uh, academia purposes? Yeah, all of the above um, is the short answer. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about like you could take a spacesuit into the field and tested it in a relevant environment uh, that goes for any equipment. Like if you wanted to bring this new fancy Mars drill and you wanted to test it out in the field on a real, um, you know, the real stratigraphy of the of the cliff that you would expect and see how it behaves with like earth sedimentary rocks or whatever um, all those things are relevant for the the field testing the human factors part of it um, is a great way of seeing how a crew might uh, work together um, on a uh, more extreme environment than just being in someone's backyard because um, there there are great analog stations that are uh, static that don't involve eva that they're really about locking down the crew and looking at diets nutrition health communications even telemedicine you know you throw in a mars delay of 20 minutes of the signal going back and forth to your mission mission support um so analogs are trying to match as many of these variables as possible it, we kind of mentioned the pools like one of the best for zero g but some of the analogs that are in a like again geologically relevant location it might be better for testing of tools and so uh the professionals definitely use analogs there's a major program um, that NASA runs called Desert Rats, which is also an acronym. Um, <laughs> and, desert Rat? <laughs> yeah. And so Desert Rats occurs in um, Arizona, like where Black Point, I believe, is the name of the place. It's the uh, it's volcanic uh, terrain. And so the uh, mineralogy is similar to like a mare region of the moon because the moon is essentially two regions. It's the mare and the highlands and the mare are vol ancient volcanic flows. And so you have a lot of bas uh, basalt like uh, materials and, and mineralogy. And so that's why the astronauts will train at volcanoes like volcano sites is that you, you're matching what would likely be uh, your interface, if you will, with the, with the actual terrain. Um, that makes sense. And, and these things vary. I mean, they're in Utah at the Mars Desert Research Station. Um, it's a very international program and crews can go there for two weeks. And that is one of the most Mars-like looking um, locations that you can do these simulations at. So that adds to 
um, the feeling of you're actually on Mars. It helps with the simulation because if you think you're like, you look out the window and you know you see the, the squirrel in the tree, it's gonna take away from your, your um, ability to separate like the reality from like what you're trying to simulate. And the better you can simulate or the closer you can get to matching that, the more relevant and stronger the data is, which is at the end of the day, the, the critical part here is like the, the data that we collect is really what's going to inform us on how we explore later on. That makes sense. And um, just to understand from the perspective of the US, right? I mean, there's different space agencies around the world. Um, have you been noticing any exciting developments in the human space flight sector, maybe uh, from Japan or, you know, obviously Russia started maybe in exploring some things in the past. So yeah. where do you see the others as of today? Yeah, um, on, on the level of the international partners in terms of like the the, the big players, if you will, um, I really see uh, like the UAE's um, involvement growing as um, something to watch. Like it's, uh, they've rapidly uh, decided that this is what they wanna be involved in. And so I think they're, they're definitely a country to watch. Australia, of course, a uh, brand new space agency and a dedication to human space flight. So I think that's significant. Um, and so those are, those are two areas that are like, you know, say fresh. Um, Japan's been involved for a while and Japan's obviously a great partner for um, everyone around the world. And so that, you know, you identified that one, that's definitely a, a good one to be also uh, paying attention to. I think um, in general, what you want to see is like wh who around the world is just say has a stake in the game, who's building a station, who's building a suit, um, because that might help that local country also um, leverage that to, to help them grow as well, because they're they're showing how not just um, the the location, uh, the government investment is being involved, but there's also um, the industry is growing because there there's this this uh, growing need for um, different assets in space. Yeah, and that would also mean access to a lot of locations that could be very yeah. similar to alien surfaces that you could use. Has that been ever explored as in, you've mentioned Arctic, but were there any other countries where um, you would have been like, oh, that's a very close, uh, you know, similar terrain to what we might experience on, let's yeah. just say a lunar surface or even Mars. Uh, but things couldn't just fall in place because it's another country and you need to work through those things. Yeah, um, I don't know about the second part about like the hardship of working through agreements, but I do know of uh, there are places like Chile um, that um, you go to their desert and it's like the most extreme halophilic life, meaning like it can survive in a salty environment. And so that's a direct analogy to understanding how life might exist in not just our solar system, but eventually beyond. Um, so if we look at how they can survive in those harsh environments, we might have an understanding of um, kind of the history and the future. So Mars, for the most part, we're really trying to unlock the history if uh, life existed there. Um, I'm not going to say whether or not life does still exist there. I that is not my field, um, but uh, that that is the type of questions you want to try to figure out here on Earth. Is like really understanding our own planet is a way of unlocking how we can understand other planets and moons. So you know Europa, Enceladus. Like there's a lot of Titan, a lot of places that have you know subsurface oceans, thick atmospheres. Um, I mean, Venus with its runaway like greenhouse effect, like there's there's a lot we can learn from our extreme locations here on Earth. That's fantastic. And now moving to focus to what gets covered in media, I'm going off some of the, uh, you know, lack of a better term, clickbait style articles saying, sure. oh, they're running out of spacesuits. They're not on time. Looks like the, uh, the 2025 plan will not happen. So why do you think there's so much of a, um, inconsistency in the way the suits are kind of being produced today and the future demand being not met or not enough players coming into that space. So what do we make of those articles or, or those new pieces? Yeah, I think um, it's nice to have them that, that they're out there because they're not just trying to get some of the like key information to the public, but in a way they kind of push spacesuit people. They're like, that's not true. And so it, it kind of lights a fire, like how do we how do we address that or make that part of 
the the clarity of like where we're at like so it's just as simple as like oh what's the 2024 spacesuit going to be off the line that like what changes are they going to make you know um and i think that with nasa's change at least on the u.s side of the contracting um and and making it more of a service uh versus just nasa doing it in-house i think that'll open it up a little bit in terms of um how we might see things produced. And then the shortage is just based off of, you know, the reality of the lack of having a large fleet of suits and that some of these suits have been refurbished for a very long time, um, going back, you know, even decades for, I'm sure, for a lot of the- So the, the, the average life cycle is like a decade for like it's, it's Yeah, and I mean, you do want your suit to last a decade too. You, you don't wanna spend, I mean, even if the cost was a lot lower, you do want these things to be used as often as possible. So um, I mentioned the Apollo suits being like, you know, good enough. And so I'll kind of go back to that, why there would have been a problem if they weren't just good enough. Um, by the th end of the third EVA, uh, for Apollo 17, the suits were um, so abraded and just say beaten up from use and from the lunar dust environment that they did have some, uh, they did have a noticeable leakage rate, um, meaning that they probably would have not been in the, the set safety standards to go on a fourth EVA. So they were really, you know, don't, I don't wanna call them garbage, but they were, <laughs> they were done in their current configuration after three EVAs. And so if we're gonna actually work and live on the moon, that's that's not good enough. Like they need to, you know, bare, bare minimum, Artemis is trying to go for a whole week uh, at first. And we know that that means the EVAs have to be roughly every other day. Um, so we're looking at four plus maybe five EVAs in that short time period. I mean, you've gotta, you gotta get as many in as possible when you have such a short window. When it becomes a longer duration thing, like just say people are surviving the lunar night. So that might not be a common term for people, but uh, the lunar night, uh, just like it dis disappears because it's behind Earth's shadow in the sky, is pretty long. It's 14 days, Earth days of darkness on that on the near side of the moon. Um, and so that is 14 days without just say solar power or the, you know, the heated, the, uh, the benefits of having that thermal boost from the sun. So you need to have systems that can survive that and keep people comfortable that if they're living there. And so will that reduce the number of EVAs during that 14 days? That's possible. Um, but we're also talking about extreme environments on the moon, like the extreme of the extreme <laughs> being at the South Pole where you have, you know, people are like, oh, you can operate there because it's 24 hours of sunlight, but it's also at a angle like you've got long shadows and you've got permanently shadowed craters which is actually the target like that's where we want to look for like ice water um so we, that's exactly where you'd want to explore which means you need to be able to handle those kind of extremes uh changes um so overall the suits they need to be a lot more robust they need to handle um more thermal shock more definitely more dust um uh, abrasion resistivity and other other aspects of the dust, but specifically like the, the mechanical side of things. Um, I'm yeah. biased, by the way, about the mechanical side of things, but um, electrostatically, like that's been our, our biggest obstacle in terms of um, how, we, you know, going back to analogs and how do you match variables? We can't match the variables of the moon. Um, yeah. You know, vacuum chambers go to, I think it's like, this is where someone's going to like correct me in some comments somewhere 10 to the negative six or negative eight tour the moon's like 10 to the negative 15 tour um and so we can't mimic that low enough of a pressure to really understand what's happening to these uh dusty particles as they're being bombarded by um the sun and you know electrons are being knocked off here and there um the just the movement on the moon um and the tribo charging so just you know think of yourself walking on the carpet you're charging yourself up well you've got to deal with dissipating that energy as well and yeah. other you know dust particles are then clinging to you so there's a lot going on um yeah, yeah that makes sense. pretty pretty complicated location <laughs> and and it appears to me from the description that we need to have a uh, similar industry supply chain like the automotives where 
He could go back to a repair station, get the maintenance done on a regular basis. Yeah. So well-established, mature supply chain for spaces. So you could have your parts replaced or have them kind of refurbished, if you will. So just taking a wild guess based on where the tech is today and how the industry is progressing, how long do you think it will be before we have a space board? People have a collection of five suits for themselves. Uh, they're going and engaging in lower Earth orbit activities or research and coming back. Where do you see that going? Like, how long do you think it would take before we get to that level of mass adoption? Yeah, no matter what I say, it'll always be plus two years. <laughs> I mean, I learned that from the, the suborbital industry over the years. Um, it's, I don't really have a, I don't even have a prediction. I've gotten to the point where it's like, I, I kind of live in the, I don't want to say live in the now. I kind of, I do live like with the projected 10 year uh, thought process when I'm working on a system. And I don't see that as like, you know, a gas station in 10 years. I can tell you that much. I don't know if that means 50 years. That part I can't predict. Um, but yeah, the, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I think that's a, that's a great way of thinking about these suits. It's not just send them and let's see what happens. It's no, you got to send them. You got to refurbish them. You got to maybe 3D print new parts. Um, you, you definitely EVA to EVA, um, moonwalk to moonwalk need to, you know, recharge and refill them. Um, you know, oxygen tanks top them up and uh, depending on what kind of CO2 removal you have, uh, kind of system you have, you might have to deal with that. Um, and then just cleaning, like cleaning and maintenance of a basic suit is going to be a big part of um, someone's job. And hopefully that's how the economy grows is that they're like, yeah, this is a, this is this, the cleaning side of things is like a full-time dust mitigation role that we're, that's needed. And, you know, let our field geologists get back in and let them get like some rest, maybe a little bit, and then get in the lab, you know, get on these rocks mm -hmm. because we want to do our field research in the field. We don't want to, you know, bring back a, a suitcase full and, and do rock by rock. We want to be able to do it on site and learn rapidly. Um, that has to go for that. That relates to manufacturing too. Like if we want to like live off of the land, which is a whole another acronym, ISRU, in situ resource utilization, then we're going to have to actually do it in place. Like we're going to have to take dust and turn it to brick and turn brick into, you know, some sort of structure and, and then have a way of, you know, maybe we need plastics and materials to give it a liner to uh, actually add pressure to the whole thing. Yeah, so there's a lot sense. going on. So I think the future's there. I think it's going to take, I think in 10 years, 10 to 15 years, I'll give myself a cushion. I think we can have what's similar to Antarctica in terms of like multiple countries uh, with dropped modules, landers on the moon, maybe connected. Maybe they've got a common kitchen if they're smart. So they get the international flavor. Um, but I don't see it as like, you know, those giant moon bases with a whole field of solar rays. And I think the best part of that, like seeing these, some of these companies and how fast they can grow, um, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Sierra Space, all, you know, all the above in terms of the big companies. I know there's a lot of companies that are supporting all of them, but watching them rapidly devolve stuff. I like to think like, you know, here's, here's a kind of a prediction. Now, please prove me wrong. Like, I don't want to be, I don't want it to be that long. Like, I don't want to wait. Um, I want, everyone wants things now. I mean, that's. Yeah. yeah. If ideal. you could have that in the next yeah. two to three years, that'd be perfect. Yeah. So there, there are things that can change that investment can change that um, governments can change that. That's what the Apollo was based off of was a, you know, large governmental influx of funding. Um, so, you know, a country that you wouldn't even be able to pronounce right now might be the leader in human space flight in five years, just because they're like, we're going to get behind this. And because uh, we're allowed to buy a spacesuit from this company over here, and we can buy a lunar lander from this company over here, and they'll drop cargo from this company over here. Um, but we have, we have the way of wanting to invest in this because we want to be the first ones there or ahead of the curve, then, you know, anything can happen. Yeah, that makes sense. And looking at the developments yeah. as of 2023, seems like we're going to go in that direction very soon. So hoping that we could, you know, own a space suit in the near future. Ryan, yeah. thank you very much for participating. It was a pleasure. Oh, it was my pleasure. I love talking space. So thank you.